uh, topic is post-decision surprise, how bankers manage the unexpected. And I was very fortunate to have uh, Dick Boland and Sherry Pirelli and Eugene to uh, help me put this together. So what's my problem of practice? Well, it's pretty easy to talk about it when we've all ex experienced a financial crisis that's nearly brought the, the world to uh, disaster. But basically, uh, managers experience outcomes that surprise by failing to meet their model expectations. I define surprise as something that you have decided to do and it hasn't turned out as expected. It could be euphoria or it could be a failure. Interestingly, most times they're failures. People don't think about the successes as well as they do the failures. Uh, a fellow called Paul Nutt from uh, the University of Ohio looked at uh, uh, over 20 years, something like 500 decisions and found that 50% of those uh, decisions of major, major uh, companies ended in failure. And I felt that banks are miss missing the warning signals and uh, that they can escalate and cause undue f financial hardship. And today the, uh, uh, the results are pretty uh, spectacular with the financial crisis. Um, there is probably uh, 100 banks in Florida that are likely to fail. There's probably 30 or so in Alabama, and nearly half the banks in Georgia are going to fail, and so on. They're really struggling. So I felt that bank bankers can manage what they know, but they do not understand how to go about managing the unexpected, the things that they're not familiar with. And so what one of has to do is doubt the organizational <coughs> reliability of firms that are constantly surprised. So what was the gap in the literature was that uh, um, post-decision surprise affects operating performance of mainstream firms, um, in particular uh, the banking sector, instead of this catastrophic stuff. Most of the research that you find on unexpected is all about major disasters. It's about Bofol or it's about uh, 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 the Valdez uh, oil crisis and then they go and look into why is it that those things failed? And there's very little about the unexpected when it comes to mainstream firms like the banking. The other thing is that most uh, of these uh, disasters or crisis situations are big. Uh, the financial crisis is big, but interestingly enough, uh, there is a number of uh, smaller crises that occur day in and day out that people just ignore or they fix and we never hear about them. And my feeling was that um, what really is a disaster point for, for banks and most companies is the accumulation of these small disasters. And if you get enough of them, you're going to be wiped out. And what that really says is that you uh, don't have a high level of uh, collective mindfulness or a high level of reliability. So that was uh, what we were looking at. So what did I do? I looked at uh, and interviewed 23 senior banking executives. I, instead of using the word interview, I should say I was their psychologist because they would, uh, uh, I'd ask them, well, tell me about a surprise and, the, and they didn't know what a surprise was until I explained the definition is something that you said you were gonna do but you didn't make it. And, uh, you know, two or three hours later, they'd be still talking and I'd have to cut them off. But uh, <laughs> what was interesting was that uh, uh, they uh, understood these things very well after I had explained to them what a surprise was to them. But I spoke to, you know, chairman and CEO, uh, president and CEOs and high-level executives. They're all university graduates. Most had professional banking uh, training. The bank size was 50 million to a 60 billion, and, uh, but most of them were around about 300 million to 400 million, which means they have about 20 branches. They've got a chief financial officer, they've got a marketing officer, and so on. So, uh, so what did I find? Um, I found three things, unique things, and, and uh, uh, basically, 
these bankers were very complacent and overconfident. Uh, they were overtrusting, and uh, th that was a surprise for me to think that, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later, but um, they have a tendency to trust all their clients, and their clients then turn around and do things to them, but it was deeper than that. Uh, deviation from protocol, uh, that really showed up with this last financial crisis of how they uh, uh, didn't follow any of their rules or procedures and started to lend to people without uh, really checking their qualifications. And uh, they're very dependent on past experience. So past performance, uh, path dependency was really important. Um, the other thing was that they missed the warning signals. Um, in hindsight, it's always easier to talk about these things, but when they really thought about it, they realized that, that you know, I, well, maybe I could have caught that earlier because of, uh, uh, of some reason. And the third finding, which is uh, not surprising, is that uh, uh, given the position that these gentlemen hold, and there was only one woman that I interviewed, by the way, um, uh, that, uh, not because I didn't want to, it wasn't I couldn't find enough of them, and uh, 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 they rationalized the outcomes and point blank towards everybody else. So, which is a very uh, uh, common thing. So they were very successful, even though some of their companies weren't doing so well. Um, so what did we do? I looked at, uh, analyzed uh, 51 examples of uh, post-decision surprises. 19 were related to the uh, financial crisis, some variation of it. There was people issues, there was organizational issues, there was uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, different types of issues. So it wasn't all just related to this current financial crisis, uh, which is what I was hoping for because I felt like uh, it, it's more than just a big disaster. The thing that was uh, interesting was that most of this stuff exists in the moment for them. In other words, it's happened, there's nothing I can do about it, I'm moving on. And uh, uh, so they didn't learn anything from it, they didn't institutionalize their learning. And at the core of this analysis was Carl Weick's uh, collective mindfulness. And uh, so I looked at those five principles for collective mindfulness, and I'll talk about it. But basically, the discussion goes like bankers were less than mindful, and their institutions were not considered high reliability organizations. And part of uh, Wake's uh, uh, basis of uh, his analysis is that there's, if you are uh, 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 very uh, mindful that the firm can anticipate the unexpected, and if they do uh, miss the an anticipation of it, that they can uh, contain that very quickly and jump back in so they're very resilient. Um, I, I, uh, I don't have enough time to really go over all of this stuff, but uh, preoccupation with failure, what we found was the banker's success breeds complacency. In reality, they were preoccupied with their success. They never really talk about their failures. They, uh, uh, they had, uh, during the financial crisis, they were involved in a never going to end mentality. This is the greatest thing that's ever happened. Look how good I am. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, 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 performing so well, nothing could happen. And you've seen, you know, even uh, uh, Ruben yesterday, uh, uh, who was, uh, was the treasurer at one point and was at Citicor, apologized for missing everything. Um, but. Uh, um, and the other thing was that they treat this stuff as a sunk cost. I've made this decision. There's nothing really I can do about it. Let's not talk about it because that's going to be a, a reflection of my skill set. So everything's fine and it was everybody else's fault. And so they're not learning from that. So banker success breeds their complacency, which is, uh, you know, it's, that's, that's not a new finding, but it is for bankers because banking is all about uh, trust and, and et cetera. Another feature is this reluctance to simplify. HROs insist on paying close attention to detail. It's basically what it is. But and bankers embrace simplification. They don't have any interpretive competence. They don't embrace skepticism. 
you don't find skeptics very often in banks, and uh, they took trust for granted. This was really, really an important point. There was uh, uh, one example where uh, a bank had uh, hired a president uh, to run an operation in Florida. He trusted the guy. Uh, losses were so significant, uh, and that company uh, actually went out of business just recently. And uh, uh, the guy, uh, the president would come up to the board meetings and talk about the, the success they were having uh, uh, without telling them about all the problems that they were having. And so they all felt really good about where they were. So, and then there was issues of uh, people and trust. And, and uh, we had fraud cases. We had uh, situations like that. Sensitivity to operations. They don't pay attention to detail. It's a business as usual mentality. Uh, when they do bounce back, um, one of the problems that they had was they had minimal slack to attend to problems. They don't have any people anymore. And uh, um, so they had uh, this inability to, to uh, transform anything into new experiences. It was that uh, mindset. Uh, one of the things that uh, you do when you're in a, uh, a uh, reliable organization uh, you look at, uh, if I've got a problem, I need to go find the right person to go fix it. Well, in banks, most of the decision in a s relatively small bank is uh, managed by the CEO. And so there, there isn't very many places to go. One CEO said, Some, it is a very lonely thing to be sitting at this table and realize I'm the only one that can make a decision. And uh, uh, so that, that was sort of unusual, but... Uh, Basically, it's their hierarchical structures that they get involved in that really restrict them from doing that. So they focus too much attention on the present. Then we found, uh, even though banks are in the manage business of managing risk, uh, that they truly don't understand it. This financial crisis has really shown that because they underestimated the risks that they would they were doing. They were. Uh, they have over concentrations everywhere. So if you're a bank in in uh, uh, Tennessee, you had loans in Florida, and you had no way to manage those loans, and so they were taking on a lot more risk. They had too much in real estate, which is what caused a lot of these problems, and so they were driven by this frenzy of this market opportunity. If everybody else is doing it, I'm going to go do it, and. Uh, the other thing we found, and this is, uh, I think, uh, one of the, the major findings, they use uh, uh, the management meet and, and, and they make decisions on which way interest rates are going to go. And uh, uh, they have committees for credit, they have committees for this. And when they're in this committee process, it's easier to make, take more risk because you're not taking any responsibility for it. And so what we felt was that uh, uh, they were forcing themselves on self-induced limits. So they show a lack of curiosity. It was just, let's, let's keep this going. So this is uh, a model that we came up with. Now that I'm doing uh, the next phase of it, this has changed somewhat. But you can see the collective mindfulness and risk perception and learning and the routine that I've talked about. And that's their ability to absorb, to explore the information and exploit that information and eventually turn it over to firm performance. So uh, basically, uh, bankers' success in detecting surprise was inhibited by their complacency, overconfidence, their misplaced trust, deviation from protocol, and over-reliance on coded information. They miss the warning signals. They underestimate the risks. They're deficient in the way they run their institutions because they're very uh, 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 linked to, to uh, what happened in the past. And the worst part about it is they, ra they uh, tend to rationalize the unexpected as being OK. So, uh, and, uh, so I'd say it's fair to say that banks are not as reliable as one would have hoped, given the important role they play in their, uh, in their uh, uh. but there's one thing I should say. There is two sides to this. I, I didn't spend enough time on it. But when you think about banks, I want you to think about it in two pieces. One is the basic routine stuff that they do, which is process your checks and your credit cards, which is very, very reliable. Very off, uh, rarely do they ever have a problem. 
it's on the managerial side where they're making these decisions that really uh, 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 we found a shortfall. So I'm looking forward to doing my next uh, level of uh, research where I'm going out and, and uh, surveying all these P CEOs and uh, hopefully we will uh, come across uh, some other findings that don't look so bad. <laughs> yes? Is it, is it a fundamental unarticulated proposition that you have that all of these things that you found is unique for banking than for other organizations? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, 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 would, I would think uh, that the self-efficacy of bankers, which is this uh, persona that they portray that they know everything, right? They're keeping up with the, the uh, uh, environment. They're keeping up with interest rates. They're big people in the community. They belong to every charitable group. Sets them up as being something more than what they really are. And uh, so I would say that, uh, uh, to answer your question, I think, all, I think it's rampant across the whole spectrum. I think people do not know how to manage the unexpected, the black swans, the things that, the outliers, the thing, anybody can manage what's there. It's the stuff they're coming. So they don't have this peripheral vision, they're not looking for things, they're just uh, moving forward. So I think it's widespread. I could take a guess on a bunch of things, but that's the thing there. But I almost feel as if you might, when you do this, you might almost be forced to have a control group of companies within other industries to generalize and then banking. Yes. And, and that would be fascinating to see because that yes. would necessarily help to prove the point. But um, <coughs> I, knowing banking, bankers know risk management. Risk management is snap. Bankers just ignore risk management. So th there's a fundamental difference there. But, but, but that is one of the assumptions you're going to have to tackle at some point in time. Yes. As you have uh, worked through the literature, have you spent a lot of time in the field of behavioral finance? Behavioral finance? Yes. Uh, not, not in that area. Because no. what I will tell you is that uh, if you take a look at some of the literature there, it, it asks all the finance questions but it realizes that bankers, investment professionals, all operate in a, in a human world. And so there's all these psychological influences. Like, for example, your, your comments about overconfidence and trust and all that. Yes. And uh, it may, you may take a look at how the experiments and some of the uh, literature has evolved in behavioral finance to think about how you may want to move forward and even test some of right. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs>